Hello and welcome to another episode of the TechBound podcast. Today, I'm talking to Ramley John, author of the book Product-Led Onboarding. And if you're watching the video instead of listening to the audio version of this podcast, you'll see that I have taken a lot of notes in this book. A couple of my favorite passages are about BJ Fogg's behavior model and how it impacts product-led onboarding and how product-led onboarding is a continuum, a spectrum, rather than a single point of contact. So highly recommend that book and highly recommend that conversation with Ramley John today as well. Please let me know what you think and rate this podcast five stars wherever you listen to it if you like it. Enjoy this episode of TechBound Podcast with Ramley John. Three, two, one. Mr. Ramley John, welcome to the show. Kevin, I'm super excited to be here, man. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's an honor. The excitement is mutual. Ramley, you obviously wrote a whole book about onboarding. What is the Eureka framework? For sure. I mean, the Eureka framework is just something that uh, Wes Bush and I have been seeing over and over again in terms of a process to improve onboarding. We have worked with companies like Mixpanel, Ubisoft, OutSystems, and, and more, over 100 companies. And it's, it's just a step-by-step -step process for, for me to remember how to improve somebody's onboarding. It's an acronym, which you know, the E of, of the Eureka stands for establishing an onboarding team. U stands for understanding really what end-user success is. R is refining what uh, the milestones of your onboarding so that you can measure, have we been successful? E uh, is, is establish, you want to um, analyze uh, your, your whole experience and to see if, if there's any way to optimize it, the whole new user journey. K is to keep new users engaged. And then the very last one is to apply the changes and repeat over and over again. As you see, acronyms help me remember because if I didn't have it, I would have been like, oh, well, what's the next step? And that's how I usually think about things is, hey, is there an easy way to remember this? And, and that sixth step is usually what we see in really helping companies uh, improve their user onboarding experience. You and I obviously know how important onboarding is. For everybody who needs to be convinced, what would you say, why is onboarding so important? Yeah, Kevin, I, the way that I see it is it's, really sets the stage for everything related to growth. And when we talk about growth, Alex Schultz, the CMO at Facebook said, retention is the most, the one, the single most important thing to growth. And really that it starts in that first impression in, in the onboarding experience. The way that I like to think about it is imagine I threw a party, uh, an amazing party, and I invite you, Kevin, to the party or invite people who are listening in right now I, they come to, the, to my home. I don't, I don't welcome them. I, I snub them. I don't tell them where the food is at. I don't tell them where the toilet is at. The chances that you, Kevin, are gonna, is going gonna, is gonna to come back to my party is very, very slim. You're not going to invite your friends. You're probably not going to give me some funds to help me pay for the drinks that cost all of that stuff. And it's the same thing for that experience. It's often onboarding is, I call it the ugly duckling of growth because we got the marketing folks who are focused on acquiring more people at the front of the door, the, the priority, they, they promote it. And on the back end, you got the product and engineering so focused on releasing new features that it's often the forgotten space where the baton is really dropped. If you don't uh, really cater that experience, you miss out on that retention. And there's data that proves it. Uh, that shows it. There's a study by Profitwell 2019 where they studied over 500 different companies from the B2B, B2C, uh, mobile apps. No matter what it is, they found that ac from across the board from three, six to nine week retention, if a user had a great experience and they rated us as very, very uh, amazing, then their, their, their retention rate is uh, two to three times higher than ones that didn't have a great experience. I can pull up more data, but really that's, that's how uh, important onboarding is because it really is, once again, setting up uh, success for anything. And it ties to er everything. You, you imagine even first dates. Like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to connect onboarding to other things, like that first impression, <laughs> like first dates, job interviews, uh, networking events. If that first impression is not great, the chances you're going to be friends, the chances that you're going to go on a second or third day, the chances that you're going to get that job is very, very slim. And that's how I look at onboarding is it's that first impression that sets people up to love or to leave your product for good. And it makes perfect sense because retention is one of the cornerstones of growth and probably relationships as well, I would say, you know, activation, increasing the chances for retention makes perfect sense in my mind. The, for the next question, I want to read a, a little passage from your book. 
about uh, the BJ Fogg model. And, you know, uh, just for uh, everybody to remember, product-led onboarding is uh, the book that, that Ramley wrote with uh, Wes, Wes Bush. And so about the BJ Fogg behavior model, you write, the BJ Fogg behavior model is the key to unlocking behavior change and product adoption for new users. Dr. BJ Fogg, behavior scientist and founder of the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford University, created this model to facilitate behavior changes by adopting positive habits and letting go of unfavorable ones. It emphasizes three elements that must converge simultaneously for a behavior switch to occur. First, motivation, the desire or willingness to do the new behavior. Second, ability, the ease in doing the new behavior. And third, the prompt, the cue or trigger to do the new behavior. Together, they form a, uh, an equation, which is B equals M times A times P. How do you apply the BJ Fogg model for onboarding? Yes, that's such a, such a key question because first of all, user onboarding is a behavior switch. I mean, as product people, as growth people who are tuning in, as marketers, as business owners, founders, whoever's tuning in, you're probably thinking one thing. How do I get my users to adopt my product? And that's one side to the equation, but the other side really is from the point of view of the, the person trying out your product, they're really coming on board, try, trying out your product to change the way they do things, whether that's the way they do things in their personal life or professional life in the workplace. And it's all about a behavior switch. So now when you think about behavior switches uh, using the BJ Fogg behavior model, now you can look at the three key elements. You can look at if you're using a lot of your people who are coming on to your app is not successfully being onboarded to your product. There's now you can look at now three key uh, variables to take a look at. Are they not reaching uh, a success state with your onboarding because they lack motivation? Is it because they are having a, a, har a hard time? Is it super hard or it's, it's beyond that level? And at the same time, are you prompting them to do things within your app? So now, for, now it, you can look at each one one at a time. And one of the best ways to do that is through customer in interviews to figure out exactly where they're, why, why they're getting stuck. Now you're trying to go in a deeper level, not just to find out where the friction point is, but exactly why. So we can look at each one with motivation. If they lack motivation, is there, there are ways to increase motivation. It's the simple way that I've seen is, Ramley, just give them some kind of token or just give them some money. You know, my, the problem with, with, with monetizing or, or dangling a carrot to motivate people is that when the carrot is gone in this scenario, when the initial behavior switch is tied to that carrot or that, that reward, when it's taken away, they're, they're, they were, maybe they were just doing it because of that reward. So there's actually studies by uh, Dr. Robert DQ or, or something where he wrote, why people do what they do essentially that they said that giving rewards can actually uh, giving external rewards can actually be anti uh ach achieving exactly what you're trying to achieve so when i think about motivation just go deeper than the external reward look at intrinsic what is it exactly what they're trying to do and i know you're big with copy and and words with, with your newsletter uh, and really that's a big part of it is trying to understand the why and and just playing that up uh, you can also use customer stories. Like people love stories. Like are there ways to motivate people by hearing other people who are like them? When it comes to ability, like is there e any way to make it easier for people within your app, whether that's, uh, we can talk a little bit more about product tours because that's a, a, a hot topic, but is there a, a product tour that's very focused on the minimum steps to get people to achieve success with your product? Is there other things within the app or or things that can really make it easy? Can you remove things that, that is really hard? And the very last thing is around prompts. So thinking about not just the in-app stuff that you see with onboarding, but also thinking about emails and in-app messages and even SMS. Like, are there, are, where, are, where are your people? Where are your users hanging out? Is there a way to prompt them? So I even suggested maybe even Facebook retargeting when somebody's stuck there, just to gently remind them that it, it's possible because a lot of the behaviors that we do is, is based on prompts. Like uh, when, when an alarm clock goes off, usually you, it, it's already programmed in you to hopefully wake up and brush your teeth or whatever next it is for you for, the next, uh, for, the, for that mor your morning habit. So, I mean, th that's how I look at it is it just provides a simple framework of 
hey, if, if, if your onboarding is not doing well, take a look at these three things. Is it a lack of motivation? Is it, is it a lack of ability because it's too hard? Or is there a lack of prompts where you're just, oh, I, I don't want to bother them, but they actually want to be reminded because people are forgetful about things that they've, they've signed up for. Is there a connection between motivation and how big of a pain point they, that people encounter, right? Mm -hmm. So if I think about a product, a product has to solve a problem, and some problems are more nice to solve and others are fundamental to solve for people. So I wonder what's the connection between the motivation to solve the problem and how big of a pain point that problem actually is. Uh, you hit the nail on the head right there. I mean, that's the bigger the pain, <laughs> the more the more motivated they are. Uh, there's this other model uh, by Bob Moessa called the four the four f forces that influence people to switch behaviors, and 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 some of the forces apply there. Uh, there's the 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 push of the current situation, right? For example, that pain is maybe pushing them away from what they're doing right now to towards the behavior switch. There's also the pull of the new solution. For example, like Tesla, right? <laughs> like what is the what is the pain? But it's just there's something alluring <laughs> about uh, Tesla or or maybe even an iPhone, whatever it is. There, if you create that pull enough, that that could motivate people to to go away. Uh, so those are two things that push towards the behavior switch. But there are actually two forces that you have to acknowledge that take away motivation. In that model, the the two ones are. First of all, any hesitation or, or any fears, any kind of behavior switch or change in, induces some kind of hesitation. And you have to address that in your onboarding and you want to remove that because that takes away from motivation. And the very last force is around habits. Like usually when people think about competitors, they think about their direct competitors in terms of apps, but often it's status quo is the biggest competitor that people have because the way they're doing things right now is is often you you have you have to kind of pull them away or kind of attract them away from their current habits so that's how i think about uh, in terms of motivation is can you influence any of the, those first forces or reduce any of the negative forces so, so that they are even more motivated before they even sign up i think that's a very important thing can you motivate people and that's where all the work that you, you talk about with, with seo and content is super critical in onboarding. Like people don't realize when they think about onboarding, it's like randomly it's after when somebody signs up. But can you imagine somebody is super excited and motivated before they sign up, they get in. If no matter what kind of hurdle you throw at them, you maybe even ask them for a credit card, let's just say something really hard. If they're super motivated and you've gotten them excited, then they're more likely to do it just because you kind of hyped them up based on those forces. That's very powerful. And I also see that same challenge that you see that we often don't take the context of how people sign up into account because people tend to have different journeys. Sometimes, you know, they got a referral from a friend, they go right to the homepage, they sign right up. Other times they go through all the documentation, read all the content. They really have to build up an interest and build up that motivation to sign up. And it's probably something that we often forget. For sure. I mean, the way that I also think about this is when you're even from the the the, the, the SERP result, like whatever um, you know, the description that you have, the title, the the referral that you have, all of that in the marketing pages you have, all of that is ma you're making a promise. And now the question is, once you make that promise, is it exciting? And when that's the first half of usually what I think about onboarding is that first half is making the promise, and the second half is getting them to that promise land. People call it onboarding, but like I, 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 I know it's called product led onboarding. But I think about it as the the new user journey, uh, the new user customer journey, and that beginning stage is what I see as as the the onboarding. Where is the promise alluring? And secondly, are you connecting people to that, getting people to that promise line really easily and and smoothly? Let's talk a little bit about measuring. Uh, maybe uh, metrics and, and tools. How do you measure good onboarding? Or how do you know when your onboarding is good and when it's bad? The way that I usually, when I, whenever I do an audit, would be take a look at that. And it depends on a product to product basis. I truly understanding what that journey looks like and what they need to achieve, particularly to figure out and achieve that success or that promised land with your product. Uh, for example, uh, let's say with, with Calendly, when we're booking, uh, uh, a meeting, right, or, or a podcast recording. 
I mean, the way that I look at it, what, what, what are some things that somebody needs to do to achieve the success? For me, success would be, once again, it depends on the user segment. So let's say it's, it's a, a sales guy. Let's say I'm running the sales guy today and I'm not a marketer anymore. I have to book some sales calls. So success for me fully is to actually get prospects to book time with me. But within the product, success would be actually scheduling the first event would be a success. So I'm now working backwards to the complete success for that user. And that's how I look at it. So success is making money as a salesperson. That's that making money, getting prospects. Let's work backwards. Next step is booking calls. So how do I do that with Calendly? How do I share that? The next, the next step success would be uh, maybe set, connecting my calendar to Calendly because how would Calendly know that um, I, I'm free? And then the next step before that would be actually signing up for Calendly. So that's how I think about it would be what is success for the user first, then working myself backwards because now I'm identifying the milestones that people have to hit to achieve that, that prom the promised land. Mind you, people are like around me, you keep saying success. People call this the aha. People call this the value moment. I like to call it success for users because it, it does clarify it particularly. So that's how, that's how I look at it would be now that you have the milestones, are people getting to those milestones? How long does it take them to get to those milestones? Is it taking them weeks? If it is, you're probably losing a lot of people there. Let's say for Calendly, because you want to book that first. I mean, the way you sign up with Calendly is you, they actually tell you to book a meeting with yourself first, because that, that takes away that hesitation. Because imagine you sending Calendly to a podcast guest, Kevin, and it's somebody big, like let, who, who, who is your dream? Who is your dream dream guest to be on this show, Kevin? Like, I'm I'm just curious. Like, uh, Peter Thiel. Okay, Peter Thiel. Let's say let's say you're gonna send a, a invite to Peter Thiel, and you send a Calendly link, and it bombs. Say like, it totally bombs. It doesn't work. Like it's embarrassing, right? <laughs> so Calendly knows that hesitation going back to that forces. So it's really interesting that they force they ask you to hey test this out, book a meeting with yourself to see what it looks like. Going back to your question, work backwards from success. I figure out the milestones towards getting people to that success state with a product, figure out exactly how many people are getting to each of those milestones and then how long it really is taking them. And based on that, I can figure out uh, if, if an onboarding is good or not, because if a lot of people signing up are not getting to even the first milestone, big, big red flag. It's important point that you make is that Onboarding is not done when people just use the product. They have to use it to solve the problem that they sought it out for mm. in the first place. I think that's such an important differentiation that a lot of people or, or articles don't make, right? It often sounds like, hey, onboarding is just to get to the, the, the people into the product and they should use it, right? But what, what she's saying is it's, that's not where onboarding stops. Onboarding goes further into successful usage right like mm. getting like using it on a regular basis getting out of the product what you wanted initially creating probably like meaningful usage as mm. well for sure I, I mean the way that i i look at it and i've said this before is on when people think about onboarding they usually think about it as just an act of product adoption just getting them to use the product but the way i look at it i look at further not just product adoption but life transformation and it goes back to that have they changed the way they they do things? Like for example, with Calendly, before I knew Calendly, the way I used to do things would be going back and forth by email. Kevin, are you available at 11 a.m.? Are you available 5 p.m., 6 p.m.? And then you're like, sorry, Ramley, none of those times work. And then now we're going back and forth by email. And now with Calendly, like my whole workflow has changed. My quote unquote, I know it's a little too far. It's a workflow transformation for me. It's a completely change. And that's, the way that I look at it. And it is definitely sometimes more qualitative where you want to be talking to your, your customers because sure, they might be using it, right? But can, can you go further and actually see it? Is, what are the things that are transforming within their work or in their personal life, depending if, depending if it's a B2B or, or a B2C app? I want to read another passage from the book about another concept that I think is really important to grasp, and that's the onboarding continuum. The, the, the key point or one of the key points of onboarding is that it doesn't have to just fit into a single box. You can think about it more like a continuum. On one end is low-touch product-led user onboarding. On the other end is high-touch 
sales-led onboarding. Where you end up is, on this continuum largely depends on your product, pricing, market, and buyer preferences. From my experience, most successful B2B SaaS companies eventually adopt a sales-assisted onboarding strategy. For product-led businesses like Slack, Dropbox, Drift, they end up hiring salespeople to onboard new users as they start pursuing larger deal sizes. For sales-led companies like HubSpot, Salesforce, and Vidyard, as they move down market, they shift their sales team to help new users find additional meaningful value with their product. I, I love this passage because it reminded me on my onboarding experience with Superhuman. Yeah. Superhuman email client that sits on top of Gmail. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they did a fantastic job in building a strong pull with scarcity in the beginning, meaning they had a lot of pu publicity. Everybody wanted on, but not everybody could get on. You needed a referral or an invite from somebody you knew. And I got one from a colleague and then went through the onboarding experience. I was, first of all, very stunned that I couldn't just sign up for the product and use it right away. I could download the product, but then a customer success rep had to unlock my account and that could only happen if they walked me through the actual product which was i think a 30 or 60 minute meeting and it was absolutely crazy they set up my inbox they showed me all the shortcuts and at the end of the meeting they even had me install superhuman on my phone and replace the the thumbnail of my phone replaced the gmail that's thumbnail so with the super that's such right. a killer move right they, they really led a horse to water and forced it to drink right <laughs> So <laughs> how do you, how do you, how should companies think about product led versus sales led onboarding? When should they, where should they place themselves on the continuum? Yes. And I love that example of superhuman. I actually got rejected when I applied to superhuman because I said I use HubSpot <laughs> and they're like, we don't integrate with HubSpot. So I'm like, sorry, we don't want you as a customer. I'm like, I want to wow. give you money. <laughs> like, please. Wow. So that was super interesting. I actually got rejected. I had to reapply. Then I got accepted finally and not say that I had house spot. In terms of your question with, uh, with product-led and sales-led, I really wanted to uh, crush that myth that product-led is, is anti-sales. I, I hear it over and over again. And I, I wanted to really share to your question, where should people start? I think you should start where, what, your, you, what your customers prefer. And the way I say it, there are some, like for example, CIO, CTO, some, some, some very, very busy folks who don't have time to try out a product. I mean, I can't imagine Peter Thiel trying out, like, they, they're just too busy. Like Elon Musk, like, oh, try out this product. He just needs somebody to tell him, uh, uh, needs somebody to explain to him exactly, and he can tell right away if he likes it or not. But there are some other people like myself who actually don't like talking to sales at all. So I prefer trying it out. So they're... Uh, maybe it's coming from a marketing background or, 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 or I used to be a software developer. So maybe my, my, my experience there were like sales, sales scare me. I don't like being pressured at all. <laughs> so I'm not sure about you. Do you, do you like talking to sales? Are you more of the Peter T level or more of the full product led person? I, I don't like engaging with sales at all. Sure. I, I love it. I mean, so that, that's my point is figure out what your, your user base, your ideal user who's going to use a product prefer. And I particularly say that because in, off, in, situa off, uh, in certain situations, especially for, for, for certain B2B products, uh, let's say like Slack, where the end user might not be the same as the buyer. For example, Slack, the end user, it's the people within, the, let's say, the marketing or the product team and the buyer could sometimes be the CTO or CIO or, or some, some, some love, higher level where they need to sign it off. So what does your end user prefer? Do they prefer talking to... To, to trying out themselves or or sales. Now we, you get to the point where I, I believe it. Oh shoot, he used to the growth at segment, and now uh, he's with Paddle. Oh man, I'm I'm forgetting his name. But one of his growth tactic is now once you've nailed that, you want to expand your horizon essentially, and that's where you now you start opening up a little bit and catering to those ones that want to talk to sales <laughs> they really do want to talk to sales and that's where the hybrid approach comes in to the question as to when that happens it it depends on the, the what stage of growth you are typically i see it when it's it's, it's starting to reach a scale-up stage where you have series a or series b and now uh and now you want to expand a little bit and and see uh other growth opportunities and usually that's when you expand out to, to a, a higher up 
Um, that's one situation. The other situation is you have a particular product, like like once again Slack, where a uh, land and expand strategy really works well. So in this scenario, having sales from the get go is actually helpful. And usually they don't call it sales; they call it account manager or customer success. But really, customer success they're a sales they're a salesperson. <laughs> really, and what they do is once you have like ten people using Slack within an organization, or ten or twenty people within the same organization using your product. Now is the time for that that salesperson to reach out to the executives of that of that company and say, "Hey, Kevin, did you know that twenty of your employees are using our app for free? And if you upgrade to X, Y, and Z, you're gonna have admin control. You'll have you have visibility. You'll have all these other benefits related to that, so that you can really be more productive as an organization." So then, now the conversation is easier because one of the riskiest part of the buying experience is actually will my will the people that I buy this app this this software for actually use it? Because I'm not sure about you, but there, I've been in situations where the CTO or the executive team like gets a software, signs a year contract, and then tells everybody in the marketing team, everybody, you are now using this app, which is terrible in user experience, but we have paid a good deal for it. <laughs> But now you have to use it. So absolutely, and it's. I think that there's also some connection between guidance and complexity. I think, for example, that superhuman. Had I tried to set up everything myself, I might have gotten it right. I'm not sure, but I can see that there are some um, solutions or, or or tools that are just that are very useful, but due to the job that they do, just very complex, and that's why having somebody to hold your hand on the onboarding might also increase the chance of success. And then another component is value upfront or um, value after the sale, right? Mm. Like we had this, uh, the same kind of uh, situation that you described with Slack with Asana, where mm, Asana, right. a, yeah, the previous company, a substantial amount of us had been using Asana already. And then a account manager reached out and was like, hey, did you know that X people in your company use the, the product? Right. Don't you want to upgrade? But we already had experienced the value. We're already mm. using it. We're using yeah. it heavily. And so tying a bow on that is much, much easier than coming around and saying, hey, pay this large sum of money and then see if your people like it. So I like that idea. And I think it, it's very, it's very, it fits very well in the zeitgeist. We talked about a couple of companies that do a really good job. Are there any other best practices that come to mind or in the research for your book, did you encounter any companies or any examples where that, that blew your mind? For sure. I mean, one, I mentioned it in, in the book, but I, I re, it's one of my favorite experiences I've, I've gone through. It's by Wave Apps. They're a financial software for products. And the reason why they blew my mind is right in the get-go, they ask you straight up, Ramley, what would you what will you do with with Wave today? And they give you four options. First is are you going to uh, send professional invoice? Second is to manage your your business accounting. Uh, the third is to send payroll or to run your payroll. And the last is uh, none of these. So what what that did is actually sign up three times and sign up for the first three. And I talked to their director of growth, and I'm saying I'm sorry, I gave you dummy data three times. Because I wanted to explore what would happen if I select all three, and ex and as expected, all three gave me different product tours, particularly to guide me to what success is. Because each three of them, the first three, now you, it's very very clear what it means for a user to have been successfully onboarded for the first time. To run professional invoice, uh, to send professional invoices, is to send their first invoice. The second is to manage accounting. It's probably success would be when they connect their bank account to see transactions flowing through for the first time. And the third is to run payroll would be probably running a test payroll to yourself for like a penny or something. So now you've defined success for all three use cases. And now with a, with, with a segmented experience, you can guide users particularly to that, to that point, uh, to that success state uh, for each three different use cases and scenarios. That does something that I see all the time. People make mistakes with product tours which is, I'm sure you've seen this before, they point out every single thing. <laughs> they point out, Kevin, here's the button here. Here's where you change your image. Please just direct me to what I want to achieve with this product, whether it's to send invoice. And when you are crystal clear on what success is for users and you segment them up front, 
then it, it becomes super easy with that. As well as their, all their other emails. Now I'm looking at their emails and all three of them have different email flows. And you can be really hyper-specific going back to that motivation. We, we can help you get three, ta- three times paid faster with, with professional-looking invoices. You can look like you're a, a pro, like a boss, Ramley, <laughs> with, with the professional invoice, uh, invoices, which would be, would, would be a miss if you're talking to somebody who wants to manage their accounting. So I think that's my favorite one that, that I've seen as a best practice is if your product has multiple use cases, like a Swiss army knife, so to speak, software, then you want to identify the, the top like two or three. Ideally, if you're just starting from scratch, just focus on one for now. But then like now you can really segment users and identify what success is for them and guide them there as quickly as possible. So I think that's just a best practice I've seen time and time again. And, and surprisingly, I don't see it as often as I'd like to see. <laughs> What, what tools do, to, do the best companies use to optimize and measure their onboarding experience? Yes. I mean, anything that, anything that is quote unquote server side. So, I mean, that it's not on the front end where it's connected by, for, for more technical people, it's, it's not connected by just by JavaScript because we're seeing a lot more ad, uh, people have ad blockers on, but as well as you can really get deep into the user, the usage data, the product data, very deep, deep in. So things like Mixpanel or uh, Pendo, which has analytics in it embedded, AppQs, which already has analytics, as well as some kind of adopt product adoption tools like Tours and and Checklist. Definitely, I want to see like some kind of analytics to to see product data and tracking in events and user data right in the, the get go. And then in terms of tools. Uh, I mentioned already a few uh, for, for onboarding. There's Pendo, which does already do the checklist and uh, uh, the product tours, AppQs, Chameleon, a bunch of other things. What I'm finding as well as they're, they're, I'm still trying to understand it. There, there comes a point for, uh, for products where they build, it, they build it themselves so that they have more trackability in terms of the, uh, the in-house tools. For the product tours, they just find like uh, uh, some kind of library in github to, to create those tours instead of using this maybe particularly my hunch and i haven't talked to enough people about this it's more so for having control in the design but as well as trackability because there is limitation uh in some of those apps in terms of like connecting them with uh with analytics so that that's two things i would see first of all are you measuring your product engagement data level and uh analytics uh, really, really well. And there's some tools that I mentioned earlier. And then on the other side would be some kind of in-app tools that you have. And I, I almost forgot the third thing is around behavior emails. So you want to make sure that your product data is being sent to your email platform. So it's often uh, tools like MailChimp. It's, it's unless you're sending those product engagement data over to them, uh, is it's not going to be good enough. So I've seen like active campaign, intercom, other things like that. And the reason why behavior emails is so important is imagine, uh, for, let's say for Calendly, going back to that, I've already sent a test, a test calendar to myself. Imagine you, Kevin, like you've already sent a test email with Calendly and you get an email from Ramley telling you, Kevin, hey, have you already sent a test email to yourself? Make sure you do that. I'm sure you would be like, what the heck? I already did it. Why are, you, why are you telling me to do something I've already done? It's one, another surefire way to annoy somebody is to nag them about something they've already done. That's a surefire way to break trust is when yes. users yeah. notice this like, disconnect between what they've right. done and what the product tells them to do. I'm sure another situation is if you have gone through onboarding and then it asks you to go through onboarding again, you know, I think there are many right. ways to break that trust. For sure, especially if some people they go to onboarding like within an hour, and then they have some people have a seven day onboarding email series, and then they're like, "I already finished this. Like, I want to get to the next step. I want to get to the intermediate or the advanced level." If you're gonna compare onboarding to a video game, you've already begin, you've already completed the beginner stage. Now you want to do the advanced levels, and just it's a huge miss. Who in a company should care about onboarding? Is that typically? Is it typically the product team? Is it the growth team? I know that at Shopify, for example, we have a dedicated growth team looking at onboarding and activation. What's the, you know, what's the, what's the best practice 
Yeah, the rule of thumb I usually think about in terms of who owns onboarding. And when I say own, I mean they're owning it, but they're inviting other people involved in it. Is I ask which team is the closest to the customer data. And typically for product-led teams, let's say for Shopify, you said growth. Usually growth is closest to the, the customer data. I mean, it's the same thing with Facebook. Facebook growth, they have a growth team dedicated to that because it's very data-driven uh, in terms of like they're seeing that data through. But for other places, it really does depend on who's closest to the customer data. For example, with Jungle Scout, it's the customer success because they're a hybrid approach. They, they have a lot of huge players come through and customer success uh, is a big part of their onboarding. So the customer success owns onboarding for Jungle Scout and for another company like Sprout Social, where they're very marketing heavy, education heavy. So it's the marketing team that actually owns the onboarding. So that's usually my rule of thumb is who's closest to the customer, who's closest to the customer data. And usually they're the ones that can see very early where the drop-offs are and can influence, make the biggest influence in terms of improvements in, in, in the onboarding experience. We talked a lot about onboarding uh, over the last 40 minutes. And I also wanna talk a little bit about the process of writing the book. And I wanna start with what, what gave you the idea? What, what prompted you and what, what led you to the Eureka model? Yes, I, we, I mean, the great thing is we were already teaching and we were applying it to our, our clients. And I think that's one thing that I've seen is for anybody who's thinking about writing a book, particularly around like a process, is to, to teach it or to apply it to clients first. And I got on a chance to talk to like April Dunford, who wrote the book, Obviously Awesome, about product positioning. She was, te she was teaching that as workshops for her clients and actually running uh, it as uh, implementing it for her clients. So like now she has this 10 step positioning model that she wrote about. It's the same thing with Rob Fitzpatrick. He wrote the book, The Mom Test, which is all about customer interviews and customer research. I also got a chance to talk to him uh, around the book writing process. And he said the same thing. I was teaching, teaching it. And the great thing about teaching and doing it as client work is now you can kind of A-B test <laughs> which stories and analogies and data connect and make people's eyes light up when you're actually presenting it or you're actually showing it to, to the people. So, I mean, that's, that's what we did. We, the book came from us, from me doing workshops and applying this to clients, as well as I was surprised that when I type onboarding or user onboarding to, uh, to, uh, to any kind of bookstore uh, online, I, I usually get something about onboarding new employees. <laughs> which is like, whoa, there isn't really a lot of books around this, this middle piece that don't, people don't talk about. So that, that drove me to like, okay, there's a need here and we've been doing this for some time. I, I don't see anything like it. So might as well go ahead and start <laughs> fill, filling out the details of the book before I wrote it. And last question for you before we wrap it up, or maybe the second last question, what was the process of writing the book like? You know, how long did it take? How frustrating was it? How energizing was it? What, what was that like? Oh man, true. I mean, <laughs> I actually use this tool. I mean, pe people use don't use it for writing books called Trello. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> Kanban board. I found it very useful because each column is a chapter, and I can drag around uh, the chap the columns so that I can move chapters around, and I can move cards around so that I can restructure the data points around it. So it's just an easy way to reorganize rather than Google Docs. So the first thing I did after uh, we have this material for the, the teach, teaching the, 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 the Eureka model is now just translating into uh, a book layout within Trello and just laying out which one's already working. Uh, I think that's another positive with, with teaching it first or applying it to clients is now you kind of have a structure. Once I have it on Trello, I, I just now I just start it's just writing. Kevin, you've been writing. A lot. I mean, you're writing, you're still writing every single day. I believe like when I saw some of your tweets, you were write, writing every day and it's just getting to the habit of writing. So for, for fo folks with a uh, habit of writing, that does, it makes it a lot, it makes it a little bit easier because now you have a structure, you have a layout. Now you just have to flesh out the details within it and that, that just uh, gets going. It took me about uh, six, six months from outline to getting the first, first draft uh, and then I had I had somebody helping me edit edit some of the words that I have with, with for for any grammar errors or structure issues, and then I had some beta, a beta reading session which I've never heard about until re recently where you get beta readers very much like beta users for products 
where they would read the book and they would provide you feedback. And it's been very about valuable because some of the chapters didn't make sense. And some chapter I had, I completely chopped the whole chapter around uh, sales led versus product led versus hybrid. Cause I already talked about it in that chapter that you talked about. So I talked about it twice and my feed, the feedback I got from beta readers was this is redundant. <laughs> I, was like, yes, I was like, shoot, you're right. Like when you're writing and you're too close to very similar to a product, when you're so close to the product or the book, you don't see that, that, that huge misses. I also had gaps in some of my, my thinking and uh, some folks provided some feedback around like, oh, you should talk about how hard it is to get uh, establish an onboarding team. You really have to um, talk more about that because people don't think about it as much. So uh, that's the whole process essentially is lay, provide an outline, get into writing, and then beta reading has been super, super important in terms of uh, getting the first, the, the, the finish line for the book. Thank you for sharing that, Ramli. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find and follow you? And of course, uh, buy the book. For sure. I mean, people can find me on Twitter. I'm very active there at Ramli John, LinkedIn as well. Uh, and on, again, Ramli John. As well as for, for checking out the book, you can go just go check out Amazon and product led onboarding, or you can get the first chapter for free to check it out if you, if you like it or not at onboardingbook.com, and that should get you there. Amazing. Everybody, check out product led onboarding by Remley John, uh, absolute masterpiece. Um, and Remley, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us, um, and uh, looking forward to the next time. Mm -hmm.